welcome to my series about all Chopin's music. Today we finish the next genre. The last Nocturne which Chopin composed, Nocturne in E major, opus 62, number 2. So the brother of the B major. <sighs> Written around three years, four to three years before Chopin's death. In the time of solitude and in the time of problems with finding new language. If you watched my previous video about number one from this opus, you know what I'm talking about. If not, you are invited to do so. First, what do we have here comparing to Nocturne number one? What kind of relationship? This is um, definitely not a contrast. We see that Chopin doesn't want to shock anymore. He, in, in this opus at least, he decides to continue his path to write a relaxation music. And another interesting thing is that both of these nocturnes also are in major key. As we know, Chopin preferred the minor key because of um, the fact that his life was rather miserable and he, every time he wanted to express his um, soul, his suffering, heart, he usually used minor or when he was uh, writing about love, then he used major. But as I said in the previous episode, I consider those two nocturnes, Opus 62, as an absolute music, not really as a program music, not as a music that, that was a witness of Chopin's life in a way that he is telling us about his life or his problems. Maybe he is looking forward, maybe he is looking in the future, maybe he is looking into another world. As we know very well, um, at that time many of his very close friends and also of his family uh, died around uh, before before or around this time and he was surrounded by death so we can predict that he was thinking about that that he was thinking that he is also not uh, immortal and who knows but i with these nocturnes as i said i like to focus only on, on the music uh, without any very high poetry hidden behind this although we can but i don't have this feeling it's is the maybe intuition maybe after uh, learning all his music i can say that i have some kind of intuition but the feeling is that he is creating a new style, creating a new language. So let's start the analysis. And when we start the analysis, the first thing in part A that struck us very much is simplicity. Simplicity of uh, the structure. Because we have only one melody, one simple melody, written as if again for the singer. This melody uh, trust me, it's extremely hard to polish and master on piano. Somehow it's written for the voice and to make a perfect legato it's a lot of work, at least for me. Uh, but I'm extremely demanding also uh, when it comes to this topic. Why it is so difficult? Because this melody is very slow and as uh, you know, as we talked about it on the last, t on the last video, uh, the sound of piano is short. So already in the first, after the second note, we have time and then 
we have to adjust the other and then here and then from here we can make a crescendo This is actually very helpful, what that Chappell wrote. Okay, but you know what? Let's make an analysis of this melody because I think it's quite interesting. So what I just played is uh, the first sentence with the question. And if we remember uh, earlier nocturnes, usually after the first sentence with the question, there was another sentence that started in the same way. Chopin was constructing melodies in such a way, took them from Bellini and from operas uh, and from Mozart also, all the time. And it, it doesn't, I mean, it doesn't disturb us at all. But here we have a little something different because It should be. For example, if it were young Chopin, we would have something like that. Instead of that, he is um, enriching the melody by giving her uh, another sentence and then this another sentence is very different from the first one listen stop stop and then this is the end of the first first uh, longer uh, part <clears throat> so two sentences and the second sentence is a contradiction to the first one generally speaking in my opinion this nocturne is mm, an ideal example of a perfect constructed perfectly constructed piece of music when it comes to the energy and this is what I would like to focus also on this video uh, why is a, a contrasting and a kind of contradiction? Because we have short phrases, so the, the, the singer is uh, taking breath very, f I mean, many times. Uh, that also means that here the singer probably has something important to say. And before we had just a long melody. Uh, we will listen to it again soon, but. Uh, now let's also focus on the right hand and here another very interesting thing uh, appears. The, the left hand, sorry, the left hand. Okay. Do you, do you, can you see, can you? Tell me, what is this? Yes, we are slowly walking. It's like a march. So now, and this is fascinating. The accompaniment here in part A is exactly the same accompaniment that Chopin was using before actually three times in Nocturnes, every time when he wanted to write a heartbreaking piece of music, very sad, like a funeral march piece of music. This was the only time when Chopin decided to use such an accompaniment. For him it was reserved exclusively for very sad and tragic emotions. A proof? Okay. First, we have 
this nocturne from Opus 55. like a symbol of March. Then another one earlier. sad very sad very sad very sincere as well as we know and this is a Chopin who is simply mm, we can say mm, is confessing I mean it's, it's writing the music that about something that was inside himself okay and then we have um, the third one, which also was very sad. Let me find it. Opus 37, number one. What I want to show you is fantastic. I think when I, when we were analyzing mm, the previous nocturnes, I told you only about those three nocturnes. I never men mentioned this E major. Did I forget? No. I did it on purpose because I didn't want to spoil the surprise. Uh, because in this episode we have this surprise. When we compare those pieces, we. Um, approach a very optimistic and beautiful philosophical uh, statement and idea. After many, many years of suffering, in probably uh, almost the worst time of his life, or approaching at least, with, uh, anyway, a man who is very unhappy, is writing uh, music using the same kind of accompaniment but warm and major comforting us or comforting himself he is mature now he doesn't want to show the world anymore how he is suffering he wants to show the world the most warm and loving parts of his heart and he wants to comfort himself. These two nocturnes, Opus 62, for me, very much, they look like, uh, like the music that Chopin wrote for himself. The music that Chopin, that was the only friend of him. We know from him uh, his letters and from sometimes also his diaries from earlier age, especially in Stuttgart that he considered piano and the music as sometimes the only thing that he had. So with this attitude, I think we should um, analyze and listen to this nocturne. Let's listen how it sounds. Is it a march? No, of course it's not. If it is a march, it's a march of happiness. But, you know, happiness in a deeper context of joyfulness, of blessing, something like this, very comforting. And we have long melody, listen, and more, more, more. And then we have short phrases.
come back to the beginning. So this is very natural, very classical. And then this is the first phrase. of the left hand Chopin is changing I mean putting us to the another direction and how looks the second phrase comparing to the second phrase from the first time the first time we had and everything was going down the second time the second phrase is reaching the first climax already we go to forte And then instead of down, we go up. Perfectly. I mean, Chopin shows us that here that he mastered, absolutely mastered something that we call energy in music, energy with the sound. Uh, instead of writing the same thing, he is building up the energy and we have the first climax so he he takes us uh, on journey and i hope you understand just listen again to um, the second phrase in the second time so-called part A, small a, of what we've heard. Because now, what do we have here? beginning of the piece. So we had a short, mm, so-called, well, we can call it a contradiction melody. Well, I wouldn't call it like that, but um, something that is inside, in the middle of the two part A, a very little B, let's call it. But this is not that important. The important is how it is constructed. Probably some of you uh, who has good ear or intelli music intelligence can immediately hear that what we have here in this small b it's just the same motif that we had at the beginning when it comes to the rhythm is the same when it and the shape is the same but of course we have different notes because this melody here at, at the beginning it gives us warm the feeling of warmth here Chopin is changing two notes actually because at, at the beginning we had and here So the this note is different and this note is different. Only two notes are different. But so Chopin is taking a closer the first the very first motif of um, this nocturne and is like Beethoven again is playing with him. So we have the development section. This is what this is a good maybe a good uh, name for that. And he is doing it in a very pretty very. Uh, must, master way, very um, 
fantastic. I mean, because first he takes it one time. Okay, then he repeats it again, one step up. And then from here is something great. Again, when it comes to the energy of the music. The last note of this motif becomes also the first note of the continuation of the development. And Chopin is repeating two times the ending of this little phrase motif. Only the ending. Because it started, I know it gets a little complicated, but please uh, stay with me. So, because we had this little motif, long note, and then one, two, three, four, five, like one, two, three, four, five, five uh, short notes, right? Look. And again. And it should be stopped here, right? But instead, Chopin is repeating the second part of this motif. So these five notes again, two times. Look. And again. And what happened here? Here, this singer with his story got to some, I would say, even dramatic moment. But this drama is not outside, it's inside. Dramatic are the thoughts of the person who is writing this piece. Forte fortissimo here, already on the second page. This is unusual. So this um, development section brings us to huge climax, uh, emotional climax. Listen again to the end of that. Now here forte fortissimo. And everything calms down. And we come back to the beginning of the piece, but with a little beautiful, fantastic um, embellishment that is a typical Chopin, Chopinian embellishment. Instead of this, we have That was a short modulation, which means we change, Chopin changed the color. And Chopin shows us again the first motif in a different color, in a different key. Outside of our thoughts, this moment. And this brings us to the to part, um, another part. Well, it's very hard here to. Um, give letters, but let's give this part the letter B, because it's um, something else. So simplicity, but also look at that. In only two pages we have three times forte, uh, out of which one time is forte fortissimo. So Chopin is building this very carefully. Um, but also in a short 
run, I would say. He, he is very eager to reach fortes and fortissimos. This is something new. He usually needed more time. But it doesn't affect us, except this music is not boring for us because of that. It is very interesting and full of many different emotions. What happens next? Uh, here we have something very... When I, when I was thinking about it, how to explain it in these videos, I was smiling because... Do you remember? I'm sure if you watch my videos you remember every time we had polyphony in Chopin, especially in nocturnes. Uh, to make it easier to hear, I put the voice of a man uh, one or two octaves lower, right? so that we can hear that we have two voices. Here we have the polyphony, you know, but I can't do it because Chopin himself, he has done it already. So maybe somebody told him, you know, uh, after the previous nocturnes that, hey, you know, we don't hear here that, I don't know, for example, a love duet, we don't hear. And Chopin was like, how they can hear? I mean, it's obvious. So, okay, he thought, next time I write the second, his voice, I write in the left hand. <laughs> of course, it's a joke. But here, this part, which is uh, rather short, has a very something very beautiful that maybe you didn't uh, realize when you were listening. We don't have accompaniment here. This was the main uh, problem when a composer a piano composer wanted to write a dialogue of two voices using the left hand and the right hand. We don't have the third hand to make accompaniment. So it was very hard. And Chopin uh, was avoiding this way of writing. This is the first time when the left hand has really something to say in the Nocturnes, not accompanying. And as we know that Chopin was at that time, we know it very well, was thinking and working on working on, not only thinking, and the, his cello sonata, then it's very clear and easy to understand for us why he put here the cello. Because that this melody is just played and taken from the cellist. shape with the left hand. Left hand has to be a great singer. To master it, um, I was playing this um, part with the right hand at all a long time. Because right hand is used to sing. Singing, sorry. singing with the right hand all the time. So then when I mastered this, then I tried to try to make the left hand sound like a cello. And in the right hand we don't have accompaniment, but we have like a dialogue. We have another beautiful melody. a way that we listeners we don't know what to listen to which voice to follow because both voices are so equally beautiful this is something new in Chopin's last the latest style um, and every time I think about it my heart is crying why he died so early because what he could write in his next 10 or 20 years of life. What he could have written, ah, let's not think about it because I get very depressed. We don't have so much music in the world because of that. So which, there are two independent beautiful voices. You can decide which voice you want to follow.
important moment because here this part ends actually it is very short very beautiful too short right we have the feeling that it's not enough but don't worry Chopin knew that we will have this feeling that we would have this feeling Chopin knew that we would have this feeling so he will comfort us later but now we approach this moment when these two two voices are united and this is very special look the first voice is play i mean the bass the cello is going from down up and then the second voice is they are very close so if the pianist plays it um, wisely then he is bringing out the symbol of united of, of unity the symbol that these two voices become one they become one because we have just one line another way of uh, to of, of, of showing a uh, unity here but this moment is very important because this is actually not really the end of uh, of this beautiful duet with cello but the beginning of part C if we can call it like that um, this is one of the interpretation about the letters because this nocturne is very um, I mean all the parts are coming one into another so it's it's like in Bach music not so easy to cut on pieces so listen to this moment and then we have here agitato this is the moment when Chopin doesn't actually change the tempo sometimes we hear in some interpretations of some pianists that they play it much faster here this it provokes us to play faster the only word that we have here is agitato agitato of course means a little faster but it means it is more than tempo it is the feeling of character uh, i sometimes also played it faster sometimes i have the feeling that an intuition that it should not be played too fast rather it should be played agitato what do we have here Okay, so here Chopin mastered what I told you that seems to be impossible. To have two independent voices and as well the accompaniment. So this part, part C, middle part of the nocturne, this nocturne, which is contrasting because it agitated and a little faster, is uh, like written for three hands. We need, it is not easy to play and we need three hands to execute it in a perfect way. Why? Because I show you what do we have here. We have the first melody that we hear in the right hand. Okay. And we have another melody in the cello. is not an accompaniment because Chopin himself writes some dynamic only exclusively for this left hand so here we have the so it has something to say this is another voice uh, maybe cello and in the middle we have the accompaniment made of syncopations do you remember syncopations from the previous nocturne? I was explaining that these are notes that are too early and they they create the feeling of anxiety uh, and uh, that's why we are agitated here. That's why I, sh I play for you only this accompaniment now. Of 
therefore this accompaniment must be hidden so that we hear the conversation of agitated two agitated persons listen and the, the dynamic is forte here no piano forte so I, I play for I play this for you a little slower so that we can absorb everything because it, it's a lot of notes. that this is the that, that we have this unity the beginning of just before this dialogue we had this this very important motif and now we have it again in the middle so second uh, time uh, this agitated dialogue with cello and violin or I don't know and, or a piano and the accompaniment in the middle and listen to this the left hand plays the same melody but a little uh, later so it's like a canon It's, it's it's not it was not easy to compose trust me for Chopin it was extremely hard but this shows that he was he felt comfortable with all the this is a contrapuntal um, work that is of the highest level will bring us back to part A to the beginning of the piece but you know uh, this uh, makes me think about something uh, very unusual and maybe a little funny that in the middle of this nocturne we have a rondo think about it that way do you remember what rondo is rondo is a uh, structure A B A C A I mean with the a that is coming uh, more than two times and here we have a kind of rondo it's not a typical rondo Abs of course not because we have a b c we can call it c then we have a then we have b then we have c and then we have a again maybe not a rondo but when when the A comes the third time, the feeling is that it it, it was like a kind of the theme of from the rondo. Um, okay, so that's how it's it's complicated, I know. But if we listen to this whole part C slower, once again I played for you, and we uh, we cut it. 
so that we understand how it's constructed. So it starts, actually, everybody thinks and starts part C of this nocturne, and this is a problem actually from this agitato bar 40, from agitato, from this moment. <laughs> But when we think like that, or when the pianist decides that here is something new, then this is a mistake, a simple mistake, because just two bars, pre two previous bars already belong to the middle part, because this is this very important A motif of the unity. So I play for you two bars before the agitato. Uh, <laughs> Let's call it part B. And then there is part C. I mean, it's a kind of new, new, new material. comes down and the agitation is not here anymore. And now we come back and what should we have here? We want this. Nocturnal, every single nocturnal, I mean, not every single, of course, I'm exaggerating. We had two nocturnes that we didn't have part A at all, but when part A came back, usually it came back in its entirety. What happens here? Chopin doesn't want to comfort us with this beautiful melody anymore. What I mean, we only have the first phrase. piano pianissimo in a different color and then we approach to some dark moment and this is immediately the ending of part A of the moment that we had before in part A just before the dialogue with the cello. So Chopin resigns, he skipped all this beauty. There must be some reason for that and it's, 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 it's worth to, to, to think about it. Why he didn't want, he didn't put emphasis again on this beautiful melody. He thought it, it's, it was enough. Instead, what do we have instead?
we have like the ending of part A and then the cello comes. So now I have to, I want to, now I want to tell you um, what I think it, it can uh, mean. And this is quite deep what came into my head. As we talked at the beginning of this lecture, um, the whole part A is very simple and the melody is alone. There is only one beautiful melody, one singer with the accompaniment, but there is alone. Then the second part of part A, as we can call it like that, because I think it's better, when the cello comes, we have a very beautiful duet. So we have two persons. Then we have the agitated section in the middle. And then when A comes back, uh, it's not anymore the same. It's shorter. It, it has only three lines. So it's like half, even less than half of the, what we had at the beginning. But, and, and instead of that, Chopin gives us the duet part with cello at the end. And that's how the nocturne ends, which is very symbolic because it's it's a symbol that in life is better when we have two than when we have one. And now when we put it all together, when we think about Chopin at that time, he was, he broke up with Georges Saint. He was alone. Going back, I mean, uh, in his thoughts, thinking back of his life. This nocturne is a symbol of it. That he didn't want to be alone. That, of course, everybody has different story. And we are all lucky if we have another person that we love and that loves us and supports us. Because it's easier to live, of course. Uh, and you know, it's it's very beautiful that the music can sometimes bring such thoughts, and that at the end of our journey with the no nocturnes, we brought out such a beautiful theme, such a beautiful topic. I mean, that's the 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 main symbol of this nocturne when we look at the construction of this nocturne from up like you know from the sky and we see that we see that part a is not anymore um, important in a way so after reaching this we conclude the, the whole piece with the duet with cello Nocturne, we have a kind of uh, epilogue and some kind of new melody, maybe.
comforting us and f making us feel warm. These two nocturnes of 62 are very meditative. It's like music for meditation, relaxation music, and in my opinion, with deeper philosophical message hidden behind. Whether we agree or not, it's um, the question of our own individual imagination, whether we want or not, of course, as well, uh, whether we feel it or we don't feel it. But all this also is not that important because in the end, in music it's important what we hear and feel, what the music tells us. And sometimes I think that maybe it's not that important what composer wanted to tell us, because for everybody the music can be something else. But when I say these words, then uh, on the other hand, we can say that my analysis doesn't make sense. Uh, but I don't think like that, because uh, I hope uh, that you think also the same, that they are in the end enriching, maybe open, this is actually my goal, that they maybe open some uh, part of our mind to look for more and to see deeper. Okay just the philosophical statement at the end. <sighs> because I feel nostalgic now. We finished our trip uh, through nocturnes. We had analyzed all the nocturnes that are in this book. And, well, altogether there's 18 nocturnes here published during Chopin's life. This was a long journey, but very, very beautiful. And now, what is now? We'll have Tarantella, Bolero, then Fantasy in F minor. I know a lot of you are waiting for this. Uh, and the Preludes, then Abruptis, then Rondos, Etudes and Allegro the concert, and it will be end. Maybe Allegro will be before Etudes or after Etudes, this I still didn't decide. Depends on uh, how my work will go on. Thanks a lot for being with me, and if you watched all the uh, analysis about all the Nocturnes, I congratulate you, because that's quite a, an achievement. Um, stay with me, and we see in the next genres next videos. Bye bye. Mm.